going as we welcome Pastor Ben. Thank you. Hey, I have your awesome. Here, I'm going to give you this. Is this okay? There you go. Hey, uh, happy Father's Day, everyone. How you guys doing? Good. Hey, I'm uh, super excited for this new amateur autopsy club I just joined. Tuesday's open mic night. Anyone? Okay, I, I thought I'd have to have one. Just one. Yeah. Come on, you guys. You can get this. Open mic night. Hey, what a great day to be at church. Glad you guys are here, and uh, what an incredible week last week. How many of you guys enjoyed the rain? A few of us enjoyed the rain. Uh, that's awesome. Hey, I want to say thank you to everybody who served, who gave time and energy and effort, and everybody who came and supported. Like, how cool is it that even, you know, we had hundreds of people piled under a tent trying to avoid the rain. Why? So we could support our family and our church family in making the decision to go from belief to declaration in Christ. And uh, it was our pleasure to be outside in the rain and to enjoy all of it and have a great barbecue. We, I thought for sure we're, there's no way we're going to get this church cleaned up, but it cleans up nice. Cleans up really nice. Uh, I came through uh, um, when they were having food, and this whole stage was just covered in kids, and there was food everywhere. And of course, you could see like Corey sitting there, like, "Oh my word!" Like, there's a ton of expensive equipment on stage, and uh, supposedly someone filled the guitar with something, but we don't know what. So uh, anyway, good times, good times. You know, my one prayer for Father's Day is that nothing breaks. That's it. Just the one prayer that one day in my life, nothing breaks. And uh, we put up new shades. We're on our third round of shades in the house. And uh, the first ones had bite marks. <laughs> These are the kind of questions you have as a dad, you know? How? how, how? Sayla says, they taste so good, dad. They're shades. You can't. Anyway, uh, after our, we're on our third round, and I'm just like excited. I think we've gone a whole week with nothing breaking on the shades. So I'm just like, you know, there's going to be a morning where I, I wake up and I'm like, no. Uh, but right now, they're going good for the third round. So exciting. Hey, what a great time last week to see 25 bit people confess their uh, relationship with Jesus. Say, I want to I declare. I, don't wanna, I just don't want to believe. I want to declare. I want to live a life that's dedicated to Jesus. And we're with you. We are so excited to see uh, people in the community and uh, our friends, our relatives, the people we know saying, I want to I wanna declare a relationship with Jesus. And so that's exciting stuff. And uh, this is a great thing. Thank you, everybody, for having a great attitude. I could have thought for sure someone would have broke down last week. Someone should have had a breakdown last week. Uh, but everybody hung in there. We all did great. We all served to serve hard, had a good time, good barbecue. So thank you, everyone who served, was here and supported. What an incredible church family uh, and a great, great time to enjoy the rainy season in Bend, Oregon. So uh, normally doesn't happen, but uh, you know what? This is non-typical always, and uh, we're, glad, we're glad we're here. I've, um, I just recently realized that I've been believing a lie. Uh, I was, my wife was talking to the kids the other day, and they said, well, how old is dad? She said, she said well, he's, he's 38. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm 37 in which she used math against me. <laughs> and um, I didn't trust her. I had to get out like the birthday calculator on the phone. She's like, are you really getting out that? Like you were born in 1983, you know, like next year's 2023. Like you can do the math. And I didn't trust her. So I had to, I had to go through and, uh, and double check everything, you know. And uh, anyway, I uh, come to find out I'm 38. <laughs> I lost a whole year of my life <laughs> last week. I've been like, I've been like pacing to 40. I'm trying to avoid 40, you know, and um, I'm not doing very well, but I'm trying to avoid it. And all of a sudden I thought, I mean, I'm two and a half years out. And now I'm a year and a half out. So uh, I'm kind of having a personal breakdown. I know for all the people in the room that are over 40, you're just give me my moment, please. You know, <laughs> like, just let me have it for, for one minute. And uh, it's, it's tough, but I've been, I've been, I've been, you know, 40 is one of those big deals. Like now it's like chomping on my heels. I feel like it just like came around the corner really quick and it's scaring me. So, um, you know, what's interesting is that we can, we can know about something or we can know something. How many of you in the room actually know what 40 is? Anyone experienced it? All right. Well done. For the rest of us, we don't know what it is. And, uh, <laughs> 
We don't know what to expect or what's going to happen. We've heard things, you know. Uh, we've heard a lot of things, but we don't know exactly what it is. But it's interesting is that we can experience something um, and, uh, and know exactly what it is. But on the other end, we can also know about something but not have experienced it. And isn't it true, like in our relationship with God, is that I've, I've, I've met a lot of people who know about God. But they haven't experienced him. They know about his ways, or maybe they've read the Bible, they know about his ways, but they've never, like, experienced it. You know, as a, as a church culture, my heart, our heart, and our desire for our community is that people wouldn't just know about God, but that they would experience him. Maybe I'm afraid of 40, but we don't have to be afraid of God. And that's something beautiful. And when we look around, even in this room, or we look through our friends and our family, uh, there's just way too many people that know about him. And I'm just, my heart, my prayer, my desire is that we, our community would know God. Because there's such a difference between knowing about him and actually knowing him. And um, we just finished a a series on the book of Deuteronomy called The Blessings of Obedience. And I love the book of Deuteronomy. I don't know if I've told you this, uh, but you should read it. Like it's a really good book. So it takes the first five books and gives you like the chicken soup model, you know, or whatever, condensed version where all of a sudden you realize like the first five books is called the Pentateuch, but the last, that Deuteronomy, it just sums everything up. And there's this beautiful invitation, really from God, from Yahweh, an invitation to get to know him, the creator of the universe. And, uh, you know, like in in chapter seven, it's it's an invitation to wholeheartedly give yourself to the Lord. And there's something amazing about that book. I know we walk, we walk through it, but, but there's an invitation that's given in Deuteronomy, really just the first five books of the Bible. But then the, the, the first three quarters of it's called the Old Testament. Whoops. And um, there we go. Family fun night. And um, I'll be here, by the way, uh, with all my kids. What time do I drop them off? That was my... I know. I, know. I have to watch them, too. And um, okay, that's awesome beauty is this, is that the Bible's written in two pieces, is that there's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and the Old Covenant really is is the first three quarters, and the first five books of that walk through this invitation that God, the creator of the universe, gives to you and to me to walk in relationship, not just to know about God, that's not the point. The point's to actually know God, to know his ways and to walk in them. And then for the next 1,200 years of history, which we see is about this much, is that you find that now we get to see who responded to that call from Deuteronomy. We get to see how it worked out and who, who followed and who didn't follow. And what you find is that in the nation of Israel is that there's two, two things that are usually given as a distinction for whether they did or didn't. It says this, is that the first one is he either did evil in the Lord's sight or he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. And you see that it even says like, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, he followed the example of his ancestors, his ancestor David. So it mentions someone before them that had walked in the ways of the Lord, someone who didn't know about God but actually knew God. And we see for 1,200 years of history, as you're reading through the Bible, which is a lot of history, I know some of you guys are super excited about all the history in there. That was your favorite class in like high school, I'm sure. And uh, for others, you're thinking, all right, um, I can get there. 1,200 years of history of, of, of men and women that we see that either walked in the ways of the Lord or they didn't. They either knew about God because they were part of the nation of Israel, but they chose not to walk in his ways, or they actually knew God. They had an experience with God, and when they did that, something in them said, I want, to, I want to walk in obedience, I want to walk in relationship to all that he has. And this was the distinction, and the distinguishing factor, really, when you look at it for the first three quarters of the book, who knew God and who knew about God? And the same exact question that each and every person had to answer for themselves is the exact thing that we're faced with today. Every generation, every person in this room, Every person listening online has to face that question. Do I know about God or do I actually know God? And this is the question that you get to answer for yourself. You may be sitting in the room and thinking, oh, I know about God. I've heard about him. Uh, My parents have told me about him or I've heard about him from somebody at work. But to be honest, I actually don't know him. It's almost the same way as I know what 40 is. I've seen it on most of you. (laughs) Yeah? Yeah? And it looks good on you, all right? It looks good. Don't try and save it, okay? I won't try and save it. (laughs) That was a sucker punch. I realized that. I realized that. But I can't stop it. 
And the reality is, is that there's nothing you can do to stop that either. Because whether you, now or later, there will be a moment when you know God. My encouragement for you is now. Get to know him now. There's something about it that you get to answer for yourself. What does that look like for you? To go from actually knowing about God to knowing God. And this is, this is what's amazing as you read through the history in the Old Testament. And I love the Old Testament. I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I, I like the Bible. Really good book, actually. You should, you should read it. But we go through story after story, life after life, real people after real people that they either followed the Lord or they didn't follow him. They either knew about him and didn't follow him, or they actually got to know him. One of the characters that I love that we want to talk about today, and actually next week as well, we'll finish on his life, is the, is the, is the person of Josiah. Josiah was a king of Israel, and um, what's interesting is that as we look through his life, there's some really kind of interesting things that you see, is that you would, you would think the nation would be doing better, but he actually is born into a nation in, in which they knew about Yahweh, but people didn't serve Yahweh. They didn't serve God. They didn't know who he was. And there was a desperation, there was a brokenness in the culture, there was like a kind of a, a disintegrating of morals, and there was all kinds of stuff. In fact, in his day, the day that he was born into, the, the church or the tabernacle, the temple that's mentioned, didn't just have worship to Yahweh, they had brought in a ton of different idols, and they were worshiping several different gods all in one location. And this is, this is what he grew up in. This is the world that he was born into. And, and sure, maybe when you look at it, it would be amazing if he was born into a better time. But what you find is that he was actually born for that time. And I think each and every one of us, when we ask the question, like, anyone ever asked yourself that question, like, which time, would you like, time period would you like to be born into? Some of you have this idea of, like, well, I'd fit into this one perfectly. Well, well, you never know, right? But you were actually born for this time, and God placed you here for this reason. No matter how good or how bad it is, no matter what community you're in, God placed Josiah in the exact community he was in. And what we find is in the life of Josiah is that he goes from knowing about God to actually knowing God, and it changes everything. Everything for him and everything for the nation in which he lived in. It's a beautiful story. It starts out like this. Josiah, and this is listed in 2 Kings 22 and 23. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Well done. <laughs> That's a power move. That's a serious power move, you know? At eight years old, I'm thinking, we normally go for guys that are like in their 70s. <laughs> we should maybe come back this way a little bit more, you know? Like, you never know. You never know. He was eight years old when he became king, which we know this, is that the high priest and actually even his mom ran the kingdom for the first 18 years until he was 18. Uh, they, they ran everything for him. It wasn't until he was a little bit er, er, uh, later that he actually started to rule as king. He reigned in Jerusalem 31 years, and he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. This was beautiful when you read about his, about his life. This is where it starts out. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, and he followed the example of his ancestor David. He didn't turn away from doing what was right. He goes on to say this. In the 18th year, so at this point, he's 26 years old. He has this idea. He's, he, he lives, you know, he, he can see, he's in Jerusalem. He can see that the temple is in operation. And he thinks, hey, let's restore this thing. Knowing, like I said, at this time, the temple was full of all kinds of idol worship and worship to Yahweh, but also everything else. They had just put everything into one big box. King Josiah sent Shaphan, which I don't have any friends named that, but that's kind of a cool name, right? The court secretary to the temple of the Lord. And he told them this, go to Hilkiah, which is the high priest. That's like the, the main guy over the temple and have him give account of the money to the gatekeepers that they've collected from the people at the Lord's temple and trust this money to the men assigned to supervise the restoration of the Lord's temple. In fact, in that time, if you look at the way the temple was built, they had these rooms kind of around the main thing that were full and they would collect money and instead of putting it on account at the bank, they would just shove it into a side room. And I love it. If you read through the Old Testament, there's times where it's like they open it up and they're like, well, let's do a count. They're like, oh, there's 4,000 pounds of gold and 23,000 pounds of silver. And you're thinking, What? Like, are you kidding me? And so these rooms were actually full of all the stuff. They had a ton of money in them, and they were, there was a group of people that were actually called the gatekeepers. Their job was just to collect and hold and keep the money safe. But he, Josiah says this, without knowing God, he says, well, let's just take that money. There's a ton of it there, and let's repair the temple. So he sets out to do that. Then they can use it to pay the workers, and they can repair the temple. So they're in process of this. And Hilkiah, the high priest, he said to Shaphan, the court secretary, in this process... I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Really? 
Like, of all places to lose it. <laughs> You're thinking, this is the guy running everything. Everything's supposed to be set up on the book of the law, which is in reference to the first five books of the Bible called the book of the law. It finishes with Deuteronomy. They find the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Like, do we not see any concern at this moment? If the guy running the whole thing, supposed to be running it from the book of the law, didn't even know it existed, you have an issue. It's actually the same issue that we find in our society today. Is that we have churches that are in operation. We have communities that are in operation. And they have a form of worship and they have continued to grab everything and pull it in. And somehow they lost this. And I can't tell you how many times I talk to people that come up and they're here one week, two weeks, three weeks, and they're like, thank you. Thank you for preaching the Bible. And I'm thinking to myself, aren't we supposed to? (laughs) Did I miss something? But the reality is, when we look at our culture, we have so interwoven culture into the church and into our communities that we do not know the difference between God's law and our culture and customs. It is. And this is a beautiful moment where all of a sudden they find the book of the law in the temple. And this one discovery changed everything. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan after he read it. And he read it. So not only does the high priest now all of a sudden read it, He gives it to Shaphan, the court secretary. He reads it, and he thinks to himself, you know what I should do? I should probably tell the king. I should, good idea. He goes on to say this. Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me this scroll. So Shaphan read the book to the king. And when Josiah, the king, had heard what was written in this book of the law, which is the book that we just went through and finishes with Deuteronomy, he ripped his clothes in despair. He was convicted and he realized, man, we have fallen short. We have so like bowed down to culture. We have forgotten Yahweh. We have not worshiped him in the prescribed way. We have not given our hearts to him. And we have intermingled and intermixed way too much. And all of a sudden he realizes that we, based off of Deuteronomy, if you look through the blessings and the curses that were listed, he realized we are living under all these curses as a nation. And his desire is to live in blessing, not in curse. So he gives the order to Hilkiah the priest. Go to the temple and speak to the Lord for me. And I'm thinking to myself, Josiah, this is a guy who didn't even know the book exists. Now you're asking him to go pray on your behalf. Yet in the prescribed way in that time, when you wanted to inquire of the Lord, you'd went to a priest. Nowadays, we are called kings and priests, and we get to inquire ourselves, which is beautiful. Go to the temple, speak to the Lord for me, and for all the people of Judea, Judah, inquire about the words that are written in the scroll that have been found, for the Lord's great anger is burning against us because of our ancestors, and that we have not obeyed the words in the scroll. We have not been doing everything that it says that we must do. This is beautiful. If you were here for any of that book of Deuteronomy, is six weeks called The Blessings of Obedience. And there's a blessing when we choose to walk in obedience to his word. And all of a sudden, he reads this and he realizes we are not living in a blessing. And not only are we living in a curse, but it's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse until something happens. So he goes and he asks, would you pray of the Lord? This is the Lord's response. He says this, For my people have abandoned me, and they've offered sacrifices to pagan gods, and I am very angry with them for everything that they have done. My anger will burn against this place, and it will not be quenched. Yet Josiah is convicted. He goes to the Lord in prayer, and he has a repentant heart, and it says, here's this. You were sorry. He's speaking, God is speaking in reference to Josiah and his heart and his response. You were sorry and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have said against the city and against this people and this land 
that it would be cursed and become desolate. You tore your clothes, which is conviction, in despair, and you wept before me. You pursued the God in repentance. Repentance is the one thing that we continue to preach the gospel, but we forget repentance. He was convicted. He pursued the Lord in prayer, and in repentance, he went to the Lord. And the Lord says this, because he repented, I have indeed heard you, says the Lord. So I won't send the promised disaster. One person's response to reading this book changed an entire generation. Like what would happen today if that happened in us? What would happen today if we actually grabbed onto it, reread the book, we, we were let, let our hearts be convicted, we pursued the Lord in prayer, we inquired of him, we repented. That's the moment in which our nation, our community, our homes will change. And it's the moment that we come to him humbly and in repentance that he actually changes our entire surrounding. Goes on to say this. Then the king, this is Josiah, summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest, every single person gathered around, which is beautiful because you actually see the same thing happen in Moses' life twice. You see it happen in Joshua's life twice. And you see it happen multiple times in the Old Testament when somebody all of a sudden grabs the book of the law. As a community, they come together. There the king read them the entire book of the covenant that was found in the Lord's temple. We know that it's the first five books. I've been uh, audio version. We've been doing audio and the book of Deuteronomy audio version is like seven and a half hours long. So you're thinking to yourself, like, were there bathroom breaks? <laughs> like, did they go through the night? Like, hey, are we going to rain check tomorrow? Should we come back tomorrow at a certain time? Or are we just going to read through the night? What are we doing here? You know, like what's going to happen? He read them the entire book. I've read that book. And I can tell you, by the time it gets down to numbers, you, you're lost. Like, you know, you can only think of how to keep their attention. And the tribe of Manasseh was 30,258, and the tribe of Benjamin. Was, you're thinking, like, come on, get to the point here. Like, there's a lot in there. Yet it was so important to him that the king, not, no longer the court secretary, the, abs, the king sat and read the entire book to the nation. And they did a reenactment just like they did in the time of Moses, just like they did in the time of Joshua, where he read through in Deuteronomy the blessings and the curse. We are blessed when we do this. And if we do not follow, we will be cursed. And this led to an amazing thing for them. An amazing revival, an amazing change of community, an amazing change. They were on a trajectory. And if you read through it, there was such depravity and there was, there was sickness and there, they, were, they were on the edge of walking back into slavery and like the, everything was going wrong in the nation until they found the book of the law. We, uh, I, wanna, I, I keep encouraging everybody to, to re read this book. It's a good book. You should read it. And... Um, we actually, as a staff, we're encouraging every single person on staff to, like, we want to we wanna make it our commitment to read through the entire thing again. What's beautiful is in the life of Josiah, you can see that someone read it to him, and then he turned around, repented of his sins, and then he reread it again. And there's something beautiful about rereading it again and saying, I want to read it again. And maybe you've read this. Maybe this book you read 20 years ago. Maybe you read it when you were a kid, or maybe you've read it, you know, six or seven years ago or 10 years ago or something like this. I want to encourage you is to reread it again. There's something in here that you need. There's something in here that we need to be able to see the difference of what it looks like to walk in blessing, to walk in relationship. The difference between knowing about the Bible and knowing the Bible. The difference in knowing about God and actually knowing God. And after he reads it for a second time, he's so, like, he's so overwhelmed, he does this. He renews the covenant again. I want to continue on. Then the king took his place of authority beside the pillar and he renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all of his commands, his laws and his decrees. It was beautiful as we even see this in operation in water baptism. Where you're making a pledge to, I want to I follow in his ways. I want to be known by him. And he pledged publicly 
to obey the Lord by keeping all of his commands and all of his laws and all of his decrees with all of his heart and with all of his soul. And in this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll. And all the people pledged themselves to the covenant as well. Probably so that they could just go home and eat. (laughs) Because it was a long day. But something happened when they read the words and they were convicted. You see this process that took place first in Josiah, and then you see it take place in the nation, where he was convicted, he repents in prayer, he actually goes to the Lord and he repents. The beauty of conviction is it's different than condemnation. Conviction, when you read, actually draws you into the presence of God. It's when you realize, I think I need to pray more. I think I need to speak to the Lord. There's something about reading his book and being convicted that actually draws you into relationship. It doesn't push you away. And so the the natural thing was to actually lean towards the Lord in prayer. Would you inquire? Would you help me? I'm going to pray. Would you pray? And if you notice, he actually asked Hilkiah, the priest, to go pray for him. But God even mentions in, in his response to Hilkiah about Josiah's prayer. Josiah repented. Josiah came before me humbly. Josiah did this. And he repents. He rereads the book and he reconfirms his covenant with Yahweh. And this is when Josiah went from knowing about God to knowing God. And the evidence in his life, what we see in his life, is absolutely incredible. Next week we'll end up finishing with his life, but. This wasn't the end of his story. This actually started his story. This is what started his life in Christ, and it's absolutely beautiful to see what happened on the inside that people could see on the outside. And not only do we see it in the Old Testament, not only do we see it in the life of Josiah, we actually today see it in our community. Real people, men and women, having like a God moment And a God experience going from I know about him to I actually met God. And you will find that when they grab his word, they start to read it. There's like this conviction of like, whoa, I haven't been doing this right. And I want to. I want to do it right. And there's this beauty in like repentance and saying, God, I I haven't done it right, but I want to do it right. Like I want to know you. I want to be close to you. I want to to meet my my creator, and I I, want to know you more. And so you find that as you have a relationship with God, you start to get to know him. It's like there's a desire again to hear his words. And we hear it all over in the the community, over and over again, of like, man, I'm just, I got to read it. I got to listen to it. There's something about that book, like like there's something in it that I need. And we see this life transformation where people go, you know what, like I've read it, I've reread it, I've, I, I've, I've prayed, I've repented, and like I want to I recommit my life. I want to I I go public. I want people to know that, that I want to be known by Jesus, and, and, and I want to make a commitment to follow him and to follow his ways, not so that we can live in blessing, but so that we can be reconnected to the God who created us. And when we are reconnected to him, then blessing flows through that. And it's beautiful because it happened in the life of Josiah, but it actually happens here each and every day. There's something inspiring about life change. When you see someone or you see a friend or a relative that all of a sudden you know went from like knew about God to all of a sudden they met God and their life changed. And we see it over and over and over in the community. I was in Market of Choice. Uh, this was like two weeks ago and Kay Shorten came up to me. Hey, Pastor Ben, Pastor Ben. I said, hey, how's it going? And she said, man, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Like she says, I came to, to BCF about a year ago, and she said, I was not in a good place. And I was struggling, and she said, I just, I, fig- I, I had to come, I had to c- go. And so I, I felt like the Lord said, go to, go to Ben Christian Fellowship. And I said, I'll do that. And so she showed up here, and, and all of a sudden she says, a year later, and I stopped her, and I said, I'll bet you your life's different. And she goes, you have no idea. She said, everything has changed. Everything has changed, and, and, I, and, I, and I got to know God, and like, like all of my life has changed in this, in this one moment, and I'm like, this is awesome. This is so awesome. Over and over again, we hear these stories. Summer and Lindsay, I don't know if you know them, but they, they, they shared their story even uh, last year at a baptism where they, they were just searching for God, and they were just constantly searching, could never find him until there was a moment where all of a sudden they found him. Something became real. Something became alive, and they said, no longer were we tired in it. Like, all of a sudden, it became so real to us. 
And it just changed their whole life, the way they read and what they do and how they believe. And even, even they, they work together and, and they, they're able to pray over people. And like just to see like the constant or like the, this beautiful life transformation in these two lives. It's incredible to watch. Reese was here uh, in the uh, in first service. And I remember we were having a 21 days of prayer and fasting. And, and we were here in the mornings praying. And Reese showed up. And I said, hey, man, this is the first time I had seen him. I said, what, what are you doing here? And, and who are you? And, and he, said, he said, I just, I so desperately want to know who God is. So I know about him. But I just want to know him. Like, I want to know who he is. And just to see the transformation in his life, he met God. He gave his heart to Jesus. Even last week, he got water baptized. I want to be known. I want to follow. And we're seeing this beautiful life transformation in our community over and over again. I hear it all the time. Say, hey, how did you hear about the church? Oh, my barber, Grady, he told me about it. Like, God changed Grady's life. And it's beautiful to see this transformation in him over and over again. I don't know if you know Jordan and Sam Cook. They came, actually, Oktoberfest last year. It was the very first time. They were getting ready to leave. And Bill and Amanda Martin said, you've got to come to church. Like, I've tried to get you to come to church. And it's been like three years. And they're like, well, we'll go the weekend before we're moving. So they went, and they're like, wow, that was a really good church. They moved to Hermiston. And, he, and I remember talking to him. He just said, man, every week in Hermiston, I'm sitting there going, why am I here? Why am I here? There's a, there's a church family I need to go home. We need to go back to Ben. We need to leave. They, li- they literally left, bought a place over here, and came back. They're like, we're here. We want to be here. This is it. And I said, what's going on? And he said, there's just something. I said, I have to. It's like, I want to read the word. And there's, I just want. He said, our life is changing, and everything is changing. And, and, and it's like, all of a sudden, it's real. There's a difference between knowing about him and actually knowing him. He got water baptized last week. I remember talking to Bill Slivkoff, and his, his wife says, he says he was raised in the church, but he's never, she goes, I've never seen him touch a Bible. And all of a sudden, like six to eight months of coming to church here, he's like, he grabs the Bible and starts reading. And she's like, what are you, we've been married for, what are you doing, you know? He goes, Ben makes this thing sound so interesting. I want to know what's in there. <laughs> There's like a hunger that all of a sudden starts to happen in this community, right? To see each and every family that's being changed. And the Wren family, they... Uh, I love it. They get radically saved, and uh, this actually this last week, we did a renewal of vows for them, and they just said, we, we actually want to renew our vows and, and make it a God covenant. We want to invite God into our marriage. When we first got married, it, we didn't, it wasn't, God wasn't a part of it, but we want him to be in the center of everything now. So we actually, this week, we, with all the family, went out and uh, went to a lake, and we just, we had a party, and was, we renewed and said, let's bring God into this. Let's bring God into this thing. Like, let's renew this covenant but, like, with us together. It's beautiful to see each and every person who's, you know, Jeffrey Nickel, if you don't know him, two, three years ago, he was a completely different person than he is today. Completely different person. It's cool to see what's happening, even the Yuzagaris, just talking to them and what the Lord's done in their house and in their family and what the Lord's done in each and every one of their lives. Like Tyler Ross, if you know Tyler Ross, who's serving in kids' church, like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, he had a revelation, an understanding, connected with God, and everything changed. The moment he went from knowing about to knowing, reconnected with the Lord over and over again. I was talking to Nikki Pope this week, and, and she said, I just, I love being able to share with my friends and family what the Lord's doing in my life and in my husband's life, over and over and over again. And there is proof, not just in the Old Testament, but actually here today, in this community, that the moment you go from knowing about him to knowing him, everything in your life can change and will change. There's something about this book, I'm telling you, that will change the trajectory of your life. And we gotta find it. Rach, would you come up? We gotta find it. And maybe, maybe for some of you, you're thinking like, I do own a Bible. I don't know where it is. <laughs> we'll give you one. Go find it. Go dig through all the gold and see if it's in there. (laughs) Wouldn't that be awesome, huh? But there's something, there's a power in going from knowing about God to actually knowing God. And you can see it in your own story. You can see it in the people around you. We see it in all the people around us. And there's something inspiring, inspiring the life of Josiah to just all of a sudden realize, like, I'm convicted and I'm going to move towards repentance. And conviction and repentance is actually a really good thing. And we don't want to continue to preach the gospel and forget the repent. 
I've watched too many people ask Jesus to come in and make their life better. But the gospel is to convict us of where we're wrong, to lead us to a place that draws us into prayer and connection with the Lord, to a place of repentance, and through repentance of dedication, and from dedication to hunger for his word. There is something I'm telling you about this book that will change your life, that will change your home and change this community and change our nation and change this world. If we can just grab onto it, if we can just read it, if we can just give our lives to it. So what's your story? That's the question. So you may be here and think, man, I know about God, but I've never known God. Or maybe you met God a long time ago and you're thinking, I just don't know if I've heard him recently. He's constantly speaking through his word. What do you feel when you read? What do you feel when you're reading this? Do you feel this conviction of like, wow, I actually desire to live better. I desire to know more. Are you letting his word like have that deep-rooted conviction in your life that leads to repentance? Have you made a public pledge to walk in obedience to it? Maybe that's your next step. You say, man, I believe in God. But like the people last week, I actually want to make a declaration. I, I want to declare that I'm going to walk in obedience to it. The fact that Josiah stood up and says, we're making a pledge to commit to walking in all of his ways. If there was one point that, was, that we just wrap up that whole Deuteronomy series in is that his law, when we read it, we read the law of Moses, the book of the law, is that his law is life to each and every one of us. When we choose to walk in his ways and give our hearts to him and give our lives to him, he actually produces something in us called life, which is what we so desperately desire. So what's your next step? Is it refinding the book? Is it rereading the book? And I loved even Josiah. He reread the book because originally he heard it, but then he turned around and he reread it again. It was that good. It deserved a rewatch. Like it was that good. And we see that the first time he read it, he was brought to conviction and repentance. And the second time he read it, he was brought to this idea of like, I want to live it. I want to live it. I want to teach it. I want my family to have it. I want my friends to have it. I want every single person in my life to have access to knowing God. He had this like aha crisis moment from, I don't know what 40 is, to, I'm going to know what 40 is. And it became real for him. And it needs to be real for each and every one of us. I want to encourage you, whether you have never known the Lord, and this is the first time, man, he has something amazing for you. Keep pursuing him. Keep showing up. Keep grabbing the book. Keep rereading. Keep talking to people. Keep coming to church. Keep praying. Keep seeking the Lord. But we desire to be a community that is wholeheartedly devoted and committed to continually staying connected to God. There's something so amazing about just knowing God that changes everything. I want to pray. Even if you take a moment to close your eyes, I'm not going to point you out. I just, I just want to remind you that there's an invitation in this season and in this room right now to let his word penetrate your heart, to get to a place of conviction that says, I oh, mean, I've done it wrong. You know, that God later sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Because we had a gap between us and God. And what we recognize is that Josiah recognized when he read the word that there was a big gap between him and God, that he had done things that his sin had created this distance between him and God. And so he reached out to God. God, would you fill that gap? God, would you, would you make the distance? Would you reconnect? And he did. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, to make you holy and spotless, to forgive you of all your sin, but then to remove shame and guilt of all the things that we hold and do. And it was through Jesus that that gap was removed. 
and that we're able to reconnect with the God who created us, to go from knowing about him to knowing him. I want to encourage you. If you want to know God, oh, that you would pray, that you would repent, and that you would ask for him to come and to live inside of you that he would speak to you and speak to you again and again through his word. Typically what we would do is we just say a prayer, a simple prayer. But the beauty is that the prayer really is just like a, an inward and outward confession of, of a belief, that we believe that you've died on the cross for our sins and we believe that you've created a way for us to actually live sin less, for you to wash over us. And it's from that moment that we confess with our mouth, we believe in our hearts, it says that we are saved and we start this process in our life. And I want to pray. I want to encourage you, if you'd like to join with me, whether it's your first time of knowing God or it's the reconnection of knowing God, I continually over and over again ask Him to forgive me of my sins. Respeak, reconnect. Because I don't want to just know him once. I want to know him. If you want to even repeat a prayer after me, I encourage everybody in the room to even say this. But we say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. Would you forgive me? I believe that Jesus came and died on the cross for me. And I accept your gift. And I ask that you would speak to me and live inside of me and change me. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you haven't left us without. Thank you that there's people in our life that will actually bring the word to us, just like Shaphan. Lord, would you create a hunger and a desire in each and every one of us to know you. Oh, that we would start a journey with you that would change our life, that would change our kids' life, that would change the trajectory of our family, that would change the trajectory of our community. And as we repent, as we come to you, Lord, may you relent. May you remove that curse. May you forgive sin. And may you usher in a blessing to each and every one of our lives body, soul, and spirit, teaching every one of our families and our our homes to our community and our workplace, Lord, would you release a blessing and a hunger and a desire for more of you, Lord, that we would commit and pledge our life and renew our covenant with you. May we walk in your ways, in Jesus' name.